right? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. So, um, right. Thanks for being back. Um, today, uh, we're going to continue uh, this uh, Gelfand cycle, and properly speaking, in fact, today's lecture will be all about the uh, um, standard or not complete. Some of the things are not completely standard about the Gelfand cycle system. So this is uh, just to remind you, last time we covered the background that we need for today and also for eventually for other lectures. And um, today we are doing uh, Gelfand Cycling, the regular story. I'll, be, I'll try to present it. And then uh, Jeremy Lane will take over and he will tell you a more involved and more interesting and more exciting story of uh, irregular girlfriend cycling. Uh, just a small comment. Uh, so uh, tomorrow we'll see some of the things that uh, uh, Alexander mentioned in the end of uh, his lecture, like the dual post only group and um, some discussion of its post on structure. So it's, um, it, it looks nice that there are links between uh, different mini courses. All right, so let's jump uh, to Gelford Sanctuary. That's where we ended last time. And I think there are some mics which are not switched off. I think it's probably better for you people, just if you don't speak, then don't, don't, don't keep your mic open. Um, so, um, so Gelfand cycling, the regular, regular case. Well, um, here what happens, we choose our group G to be the unitary group and uh, it's Lie algebra. You can think about it as n by n complex matrices, which are anti-Hermitian. And then uh, there is a nice way to think about its dual. Of course, you can also identify it with G, uh, but it's kind of nicer to identify it with, uh, sorry, maybe I use Xi as last time, as a notation. Uh, you actually identify it with the space of Hermitian matrices. So these are simply Hermitian n by n matrices. Uh, and the pairing is the imaginary part of the trace of the product. It's easy to see that it establishes uh, a perfect duality between the two spaces. Now, um, the quadjoint action um, is simply an action by conjugation. All right. And quadjoint orbits, well, this is simply conjugacy classes in the space of Hermitian matrices. And we actually know from our first year linear algebra course that every Hermitian matrix is conjugate to a diagonal matrix with uh, real eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda n. And moreover, we can choose if we want those lambdas to be ordered. Let's say we can choose the non-increasing order. Of course, here there is always a big difference with spectral series because they say lambda one should be the smallest one. For some reason, I have, at least I, I'm used to, to having lambda one being the biggest one, but in any event, you can order them and let's order them in this way. So one more remark about this particular situation. Um, consider sigma mapping psi to psi bar. And uh, this is just a complex conjugation, right? So star 
was a Hermitian conjugation, so complex conjugation and transposition. And this is complex conjugation. So then um, it turns out, this is easier to check, that this is a Poisson anti-involution. So this map changes the sign of the Poisson bracket. And notice that um, those, uh, cons those diagonal matrices that we denoted by lambda, they all satisfy the condition that lambda bar is equal to lambda. That's just because the eigenvalues are real. And in particular, this means that um, for each conjugacy class, for each quadrant orbit, the fixed point set of uh, sigma is non empty for any lambda. Right. So now, finally, um, we define an interesting map. We're going to call it the Galfin cycling map. And the map famously looks as follows. So you take your Hermitian n by n matrix. So here I write only the corner matrix elements. And first of all, we extract from it the ordered eigenvalues. Well, uh, let me denote them lambda n1, lambda n2, and so on. And n here stands for the size of the matrix. That's because we're going to look at other, at some sub matrices. And now we start cutting upper left corners of the matrix from the bigger one to the smaller ones. Uh, I must say, I'm used to cut down right corners, but I think for us it's more convenient to to cut those upper left corners. So sometimes if I get confused, you tell me. And then we are, we are writing the eigenvalues of those smaller matrices in this kind of triangular pattern. So in the end, we will have uh, the only eigenvalue of the N one by one matrix, which is actually equal to psi one one. And uh, this all fits into a triangular tab tableau or a triangular pattern, whatever you want to call it. So, um, so this is all contained in R to the power capital N, and let's say capital N is small n plus n plus one over two, right? So this is. Uh, you can say this is a vector, the, the, the outcome of the map uh, is a vector in that space. Uh, but uh, again, uh, as a part of uh, linear algebra course, we know that those lambdas satisfy the so-called interlacing inequalities. So the interlacing inequalities go as a zigzag between each pair of rows. So now I took the upper row and the next row, and between them, there would be such a zigzag, and this would be the case between each pair of rows. So lambda ki greater or equal to lambda k minus one i greater or equal lambda k i plus one. So uh, those inequalities, they define a polyhedral cone. Let, let us call it CGZ. So that's a polyhedral cone, um, which is uh, defined by interlacing inequalities. And so this uh, image of the uh, Gelfand cycling map, this triangular tableau or triangular pattern belongs to, to the cone. Um, so perhaps before, uh, going further, let me introduce a little bit of notation. Um, so first of all, 
let me say that um, in my part of today's presentation, we will always be interested in the interior of the uh, geofencycling cone. And then, then later on, with Jeremy, we're going to adventure to the boundaries. So, um, so what does it mean, the interior? This means that all inequalities are strict. So there are nowhere in this pattern of interlacing inequalities, there is inequality. So the corresponding points, so uh, are called regular, regular points or regular patterns. Now let me denote this map by GZ and uh, G star, let me call it G star reg. This is not a completely standard notation, but still let me use it. So these are the matrices. These are the Hermitian matrices, uh, which are in the pre-image of the interior of the cone. So these are matrices for which no inequalities uh, are non-strict for matrices and sub-matrices. Right. So um, now um, let me uh, let me say a bit more. Um, here is one more fact that we're going to need. So suppose we take that this set of regular regular matrices. And let's consider uh, the sigma invariant part. I re recall sigma is, uh, mm, uh, is a complex conjugation. So these are actually matrices with real uh, entries. So, and we, we want no inequalities, no, no, no coincident eigenvalues in all this list of triangular, in, in all these triangular tableau. So then it turns out that uh, this thing consists of, uh, uh, or equal, let me say, this is slightly bad language. So there are two to the power M, where M is N times N minus one over two. Connected components. And just to, to make it a little bit more intuitive, let me give an example. And the example, of course, as you can imagine, I'm not gonna use a difficult example. I'm gonna use a simple example of n equal to two. So what are those uh, size? So those size are symmetric matrices with real values, with real matrix elements. And now, uh, when such a thing is regular, in fact, is regular, this point is regular, if it only if the off diagonal entry is non zero. So that's because if B is zero, then the top matrix element A is equal to one of the two eigenvalues. Uh, either either the top one or the uh, the bottom one. So there is uh, uh, there is a remark by Jeremy that actually just a regular usually usually means something else. That's a union of regular quadrant orbits. So sorry, I misuse I misuse this regular thing. But then, Jeremy, you can later on change the notation or correct it. Yeah, sorry, I think that that's a really non-standard, non-standard thing. But if I go back to to my two by two example, now it's clear what are the two connected components. So these are such two by two matrices which would be smaller than zero and be bigger than zero, right? So these are two connected components. Uh, of this set. Okay. 
So now um, it's a big moment. Let me state the, the theorem of Gilman and Sternberg. Um, and of course, it, I, I don't think it's stated exactly in that way in their paper, but in spirit, that's, uh, that's how, how it goes. So it will be theorem in many parts. So um, first of all, on this G star reg, the map GZ is smooth. And maybe just for your information, and it's continuous on, on the whole of G star. Um, so then um, lambda and I are Casimir functions. So they uh, Poisson commute with everything. And actually, all those functions, lambda ki, lambda lj, so they, they all Poisson commute for all admissible K, kl ij. All right. So now part two, uh, there is an action of a torus of dimension M, which is N times N minus one over two. So that's the action on G star rack. This moment map given by those lambda k i's for k, which goes from one to n minus one, and i going from one to k. So the Casimir functions they don't generate anything. So all the other functions they generate actually circle actions, and in total you get an action of this torus. Strictly speaking, I haven't defined moment maps for Poisson in Poisson geometry, but uh, one can also say that on each coadjoint orbit, which non-trivially intersects uh, G star reg, there you, you, get, you get this moment map property. And um, number three, uh, choose A connected component, let's say F, inside this G star reg sigma. Remember, there are many of them, two to some power, two to the power M of them. So let's choose one of them. So then um, they exist functions. Ki. So these are actually functions taken values in, in a circle, um, such that there are two things. So on that connected component, they vanish, uh, or maybe three things, sorry. Oops, yeah, okay, let it be. Uh, so lambda ki phi ki is a coordinate system. Uh, 
Und gstar reg. And finally, we have by kks is equal in that coordinate system is what you expect it is. Right. Okay. So, um, um, so we have, uh, um, uh, so if, if you want to, um, to give enough time to Jeremy, we, we don't have that much time, but what I, I, I'll spend the, the rest of my contribution today on giving you some ideas of a proof. So that's, you, you see, there are many, many things in that theorem. So this theorem gives you a kind of more or less complete answer to so-called question one that they formulated last time. So it, uh, uh, it exchanges, it, it finds a dense subset, this G star reg, and in this, on this dense subset, the linear Poisson bracket by KKS is just simply identified with the constant, with the constant Poisson bracket, that, which is described here. So it's, uh, it's a very nice observation. Now let me give you some incomplete ideas of the proof. So first of all, uh, we said that lambda and i are Casimir functions. And why is that? Well, uh, remember we, we said before um, that the uh, quadrant orbits in our case, uh, these are uh, conjugacy classes. And this means that the eigenvalues are fixed. In particular, ordered eigenvalues are fixed. So in other words, lambdas are constant uh, on, on the leaves because quadrant orbits are leaves of pi kks. And uh, now, uh, if you have a function which is constant on the leaves, then it's necessarily a Casimir function. So remember, we, we had that, uh, that drawing that we have our Poisson manifold. And here, we, uh, we have a leaf. And then the bivector is tangent to the leaf. Right. If a vector field is tangent to the leaf, you differentiate a function which is constant on the leaf with this vector field, you get zero. The same thing happens here. So that's because they are constant on quadrant orbits. And because quadrant orbits are leaves. Okay, so far so good. Now the next thing, and this is very famous about the Gelfand Cytron system, we have this uh, um, nested family of embeddings of unitary groups and unitary Lie algebras. And this nested family, that's exactly what happens when we start cutting those corners, right? Cutting corners, that's, uh, it defines for you embeddings. Uh, now, in the other direction for dual spaces, of course, there will be maps in the opposite, in the opposite direction. Now, suppose we, we have here somewhere UK star and somewhere down the road UL star. Right? So the uh, functions lambda ki are Casimir for this UK star. And uh, functions lambda lj are some functions for u star l, actually Casimir for u star l, 
but not at all Casimir for UK star. However, since UKI are Casimir, well, their brackets with everything which comes down the road from here, they are vanishing. And in particular, these ULJs. So that's um, that's the magic of this um, Gelfand cycling scheme. Now, um, this covers um, more or less the first part of the theorem. Now, what about the second part? I said that, well, there exists an action and I want to prove that this is, uh, I, I will give you a construction of the action. In principle, we could have proved even together that this is indeed that action, but I think it's a little bit cumbersome or maybe I'm, I'm not able to do it sufficiently elegantly. So uh, this, is, this goes under the name of the seam action, or seam torus action. And uh, the idea is as follows. So let's first write the form, following formula. So psi, and let me choose, uh, let me choose some block metrics where it will have a unitary k by k block and here it will be simply one. And here it will be the inverse of that guy. And so this will be GK, this will be GK minus one. And I want the resulting matrix here to be of the following form, something here. Here will be a diagonal matrix with eigenvalues lambda KI. So this is a diagonal matrix. And here there will be something, let's say Z and Z bar. In fact, UK is not quite unique, but there is certainly such a UK. I can diagonalize my uh, K by K block. Now uh, let me choose T to be of the form T1, TK, 1, 1. Let me, let me choose it to be a unitary matrix of that form. So this is, uh, this makes part of a torus of dimension, of dimension K. So those T1, TK, they're unitary numbers, numbers of absolute value, complex numbers with absolute value one. So, right. Now uh, we define an action. Uh, so T maps theta to the following funny um, combination times GK T GK minus one minus one. Wow, right? It's, it's a kind of, if you've never seen such a formula, it looks interesting, strange. Uh, maybe uh, I rewrite it one more time. You can also rewrite it like this, GK. Let me denote this guy, uh, Zeta K, and here T, Zeta K, T minus one, GK minus one. So you can play this game for every K. It turns out that, uh, so the, the actions for different K, they all commute. So you do get uh, an action of a torus of dimension one plus and so on, plus N minus one, which is what we want, n times n minus one over two, and which is m. So this, this torus acts. And it turns out the triangular tableau, lambda ki, uh, 
uh, moment maps. So then, of course, uh, that's this statement that in principle we could have proved together. Uh, but uh, so if you want at some point, you can ask me or you can try to do an exercise. We have a very explicit formula for symplectic structure on each orbit. And you can, you can simply try to substitute there. So of course, uh, this action is slightly horrible, but it's, uh, it's not, a, not, not a big deal. If you substitute it there, you will see that lambda KIs indeed come out as moment maps. Now, uh, the last step in the procedure, the one that I wanted to, to actually show you, and this will be the final point for me uh, for today. So um, let's say this is this is my G star. Well, of course, I don't know whether it's a good way to draw vector spaces. So this is my G star. So inside somewhere um, there is. Uh, there is a singular locus. So outside is G star reg. So G star reg is outside. And uh, somewhere here, there is this uh, G star reg sigma. Of course, they shouldn't, well, sorry, they shouldn't intersect, right? And, and let's say this is, this is a component. F that we wanted to choose. Then it turns out that um, H fiber is GZ minus one lambda. One should say a regular fiber. Intersects each component transversally and exactly once. So somewhere here, I don't know which color to choose. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, so so this is this is um, um, this is a fiber. The fiber is isomorphic to an M dimensional torus and it intersects each component exactly once. So because of the moment map condition, we know that lambda ki, lambda lj, the bracket, is equal to delta kl, delta ij. That's more or less the, by, by definition, since lambdas, these are things which generate the, uh, the circle actions, then coordinates on circles, they, they have those uh, uh, Poisson brackets. So that that's, that's follows from the moment map. condition. So um, to simplify life, let me write an expression for this symplectic, instead of a Poisson bracket, let me allow me to consider the symplectic structure on some orbit. So um, now uh, we know that it will have this term, d lambda ki wedge d phi ki. So that's, that's because of this. Uh, we also know that uh, there is no d phi d phi term. So that's because the, uh, the lambdas, they Poisson commute. But maybe, maybe, who knows? Maybe there is some term omega kl ij d lambda ki, d lambda lj. And this thing depends only of lambda. That's because, again, of the uh, torus section. So the torus section generated by the moment map is a symmetry. So nothing depends on those files. So could it be that there is such a term? In fact, not really, because uh, uh, put, let's put 
phi equal to zero. So let's sit on this fixed uh, on, on, on this uh, sigma fixed point component. But then we know that the restriction of omega restricted to f, this will be only this uh, this last term, right? Because when you restrict to f, phi is equal to zero, the first term disappears. There is only the second term. But then we know that f, but f is Lagrangian, right? Remember the, the wisdoms from the yesterday's lecture. If it is Lagrangian, then omega has to be equal to zero there. So this means that this uh, omega restricted to f is zero. And this means that there is no extra term. And um, that's the uh, Darbu type formula with action angle variables. And uh, I mean, you can easily turn it into a Poisson bracket. So I've done it for a symplectic form because this argument is slightly easier, but it would also be fi fine for, um, for Poisson brackets. All right, so this is a quick, uh, quick overview of how one can prove the Gilman-Sternberg story. But now let me just say that it was very, very essential, right, that we were sitting on this uh, G-star reg. So there, all the fibers are those tori that are described by the theme action. And the story is a lot more interesting and a lot more complicated. If you try to go outside this uh, very much controlled regime, so now some of those interlacing inequalities can actually be equalities. Uh, what happens then? And uh, I think I should uh, stop here and pass uh, the word to Jeremy Lane, who will uh, explain what happens in that case. So I'll be happy to take questions and step down for today. Okay. Uh, Jeremy is suggesting a very short break. So uh, five, five minutes, right? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know. Jeremy, la, la, five minutes, is it good? Or 10, maybe. Ah, okay. So okay. just. All right, so uh, then I stop sharing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm
Oh. Yeah, sorry, thanks for the break. Okay, so are you ready? So yeah, we can start. Okay, thank you. All right, so yeah, so uh, it's uh, great and also terrible to follow Anton because he gives such good talks uh, that everything is set up, but also I think uh, I'm not as good, <laughs> but hopefully still this will be okay. Um, yeah, so I wanna talk about fibers of Gelfand Zetland systems. Uh, so let's just start with an overview and some motivation for this, uh, this subject. So for starters, we want to look at a particular co-joint orbit. Um, so Anton was just talking about all the co-joint orbits at the same time, but we want to fix um, our eigenvalues uh, so that we have a particular co-joint orbit. And then um, corresponding to this uh, fixed co-joint orbit, uh, so in the, the tableau of inequalities, the top row is fixed, and then that defines some kind of polytope um, because the rest of uh, the coordinates below have to satisfy some inequalities. Um, and it's, it's a compact, uh, it's a polytope, um, not a cone. So this is the gelfand zetland polytope. Um, and what we're going to see in a second is that um, it's an interesting polytope. Uh, and uh, you can try to encode the face structure of this polytope using some kind of very obvious combinatorial gadget, which I'll call a gelfand zetland pattern. Um, and this is nice because it'll help us to sort of describe our results. Right, and then uh, I'm going to denote by F the system that Anton just introduced. So this is the, the map to R big N whose coordinates are given by those functions lambda ki. Um, and of course, uh, since everything in the orbit is sent to this particular polytope, I'm just going to call it a map to the polytope. So this is the gelfand zetland system on the coadjoint orbit. Um, and yeah, so, so some facts about this map that are interesting. So the regular fibers of this map are Lagrangian. I think Anton already explained why this is true, but in fact, uh, the generic fibers, or not generic fibers, all fibers of this map are, are actually isotropic um, with respect to the symplectic form. Um, and the singular fibers, uh, a priori, they're not even smooth manifolds, but actually they're, they're quite nice. Um, and they carry a sort of a residual action of some smaller torus and some of them are even Lagrangian, even though they're not, uh, they're not themselves tori. So these are all very interesting features for an integrable system and its singular fibers. And this is, a, I think, an important family of examples to study if you're interested in integrable systems and their singular fibers. Um, so in more detail, some of the things we're gonna show. So first of all, the way to study these fibers is that they have this uh, tower structure. Um, so it's a tower of certain bundles of homogeneous spaces. And we can actually show this in the, the lecture. It's, it's not hard to see at all. Um, and then uh, in fact, up to diffeomorphism, this space only depends on the associated face of the gelfand zetland polytope. So in other words, you encode the gelfand zetland polytope spaces as GZ patterns. And then now we have a correspondence between fibers up to diffeomorphism and GZ patterns. And then you can describe actually quite concretely, which is what I'm gonna show uh, partway through the talk, the diff, like an explicit diffeomorphism, diffeomorphic description, however you wanna call it, of the fibers in terms of the GZ pattern. So you can sort of read off exactly what the fiber is uh, from this combinatorics. Um, in particular, there's a combinatorial formula for the dimension of the fibers um, and some other things. And I'll give some references at the end. So some of these results is kind of mixed. There's various authors that were involved in this and I'll try to say who proved what as we go. Yeah, and some motivation 
Um, and this is kind of orthogonal in some ways to the other motivations for this, uh, this uh, mini course, but then I think also there's a lot of overlap. So just at a really fundamental and basic level, uh, we have some spaces, which are these fibers, and they're parameterized by these combinatorial gadgets, which are these GZ patterns. And so it's just a fun game to say, well, if I take a particular GZ pattern, what is the topological space corresponding to that? And can I like read, say, some topological invariance of the space from the pattern, things like this? I think that's just at a, a really basic level, kind of a, an interesting type of question. Um, but then there's also some maybe more serious applications. One would be uh, bohr sommerfeld quantization. So we'll come back to that hopefully at the end of the talk. Uh, another is Lagrangian floor theory, which is not my work, but work of some co-authors, or not co-authors of mine, but some group of co-authors um, that are studying uh, the Hamiltonian displaceability of these Lagrangian singular fibers. Um, so I'll mention who those people are later on. Another way that this is really interesting is that um, if you're familiar with uh, the local normal form theory for torque systems or the local normal form theory for say non-degenerate integrable systems with singularities um, that are like of Eliasson type, then there's very explicit uh, descriptions of how the symplectic form and the different functions look in a neighborhood of a given singular fiber. And also, of course, you can describe what the singular fiber is topologically. And this is an example where that theory doesn't apply at all. Um, or it applies in some cases, but not all of them. So it doesn't really fit the, the situation very well. And uh, since it's a very nice family of systems, I think there's a very natural question here of, of what the proper singularity theory for these integrable systems should be. And this is not something that I'm gonna explain in this talk, but I think it's like a future problem that hopefully somebody who, who cares about integrable systems can, can make some theory out of. And then the, the last uh, piece of motivation is that, um, well, we'll see this maybe later in the week, but gelfand zetland systems are a particular example of a much larger family of systems, which can be um, constructed by torque degeneration, which means something specific um, that again, I'll, I'll maybe explain uh, later this week. Um, and since there's so many systems that are constructed by torque degeneration, it's kind of a natural question to understand those systems and maybe their singularities and so forth um, from the same perspective as four. And since this is a very concrete uh, subfamily of those systems where we can describe their singularities in some way, and this raises a lot of uh, potential conjectures about how the singularities of general integrable systems constructed by torque degeneration might look. And uh, there's some, uh, things that are even written down in, in some papers somewhere about various conjectures. Um, so, which is to say that uh, at the end of the day, this is a very important family of examples. Um, yeah, so what do I mean by uh, GZ patterns? So as Anton was saying, we have the gelfand zetland inequalities. So let's just take, uh, for example, a generic gelfand zetland polytope in dimension three. So the top row here, um, these three numbers are fixed because we're on a fixed co-adjoint orbit. And I'm supposing that they're all distinct. So the inequalities in the top row are strict. So then we have three functions and they satisfy these inequalities and you can draw the polytope uh, given by these three coordinates uh, satisfying these inequalities. And it looks something like this. And uh, in particular, the, the faces of this polytope just determine, are, are determined by which of these inequalities are strict and which of them are, are equalities, right? And so rather than writing out when we try to talk about a particular face, uh, all these numbers, we should just replace the numbers with vertices. And if there's an equality, we put a line between the two vertices. And if there's a strict inequality, we don't put a line between the two vertices. So in this way, we can take a face of uh, this polytope and we can encode it in some plain graph. So here's how it looks for this polytope. So the co-dimension zero face, the interior of the polytope uh, corresponds to this pattern because all three of the, um, of the coordinates are, are distinct. There's no equalities, obviously. 
And then as you go down to the co-dimension one faces, you have one uh, equality. So there's all these possible faces here. So there's six of them in total. And then for co-dimension two faces, uh, the patterns look something like this. And for co-dimension three faces, which are the vertices of this polytope, um, they look something like this. And the general rule here is that the dimension of the face is going to equal the number R of connected components in the gelfand zetlin pattern that do not contain vertices in the top row. So in co-dimension zero, so this is a three-dimensional face, and there's three connected components that are not in the top row because there's these three vertices. Um, on the other hand, uh, in the co-dimension one case, uh, here there's two connected components because these two vertices form a connected component and then this other vertex forms a connected component. So this is a face of dimension two um, and so on. And you see in the vertices, all of the, uh, all of the connected components are connected to the top row, right? So there's no free variable, so it has dimension zero. The other interesting thing that happens here is that um, because of how the interlacing inequalities look, uh, some inequalities force other uh, some equalities force other equalities, right? So if you know that uh, lambda two one equals lambda one one equals uh, lambda two two, then of course lambda two one equals lambda two two. So you get these diamond patterns that occur. And these are interesting because if you look back at the polytope, um, you can kind of see that uh, everywhere this polytope is locally delzant, um, except at this vertex here. And this is the vertex corresponding to that diamond. And at this vertex, there's actually four edges that emanate from the vertex. So it's not even simple. The polytope's not simple at this point. So these polytopes are, are, are already very interesting coming from the perspective of, of torque uh, polytopes, um, because when you look at uh, say like smooth uh, torque symplectic manifolds, um, you get nice delzon polytopes and they satisfy all these conditions. And here you have polytopes that don't uh, even have the condition of being simple. Yeah, so then um, you can imagine if you look at a different orbit. So in the previous case, if you're looking at U3 and all the three eigenvalues are distinct, then your orbit is going to be uh, up to diffeomorphism, the variety of complete flags in C3. If you fix the first two eigenvalues to be equal to each other, then this is going to give you an orbit which is uh, up to diffeomorphism, the Grassmannian of two planes in C3. And here, if you fix these two uh, numbers to be equal, then you get this other number here should equal them as well because of the triangular shape of the tableau. And so you only have two gelfand zetlin functions on the orbit that are non-constant, which is good, of course, because uh, we want an integrable system. So there should be half as many functions that are non-constant as the dimension of the manifold. In this case, Grassmannian of two, uh, two planes in C3 has dimension four, real dimension four, and we have two functions. So it's still enough to have an integrable system. And uh, if you try to draw a picture of the polytope defined by these inequalities, you get something that looks like this. And you can, again, enumerate the faces of this polytope uh, in the following way, and you get something like this, right? So I think uh, hopefully the, the correspondence is, is clear to everyone, right? You just take uh, a given face where there's certain inequalities and certain strict inequalities and you make a, you make a nice graph out of it. And this is gonna be very convenient for us. So this is not at all complicated. I, sometimes you tell somebody, oh, this is like combinatorics and they, they think it's something complicated. This is not complicated. Yeah, so then in larger dimensions, of course, you can get sort of like more exotic looking uh, patterns corresponding to the different faces of your, of your polytope. And you can imagine hopefully uh, many different ways that this could look. Okay, so now I want to try to explain the tower structure that the fibers of, of the gelfand zetlin system have. And hopefully it's something that's very simple. Um, so I hope that my explanation is, is not confusing. Um, so 
but but it's a tower. So we're going to build it inductively. And I'm just going to start by looking at a, a particular um, level in that tower. And then we'll apply the following sort of lemma, which is the next two pages um, inductively to, to describe the fiber. So let's just consider uh, some K and uh, the inclusion that Anton was talking about of the group UK into UK plus one, which is sending the K by K unitary matrix to a K plus one by K plus one unitary matrix. And there's a, there's a projection that's dual to this, which goes from the co-joint orbit in UK plus one down to the space of Hermitian K by K matrices. I write it this way, but it's really just Hermitian K by K matrices. And it sends a matrix A, which has this form, where C is a real number and X is a Hermitian K by K matrix to the Hermitian K by K matrix X. So if we fix uh, two non-increasing sequences, lambda K and lambda K plus one, which you think of as the two rows um, in your gelfand setlin pattern of, of inequalities, um, then we can consider the following diagram where we have the orbit uh, in UK plus one that we're considering. And then we have uh, an orbit in UK. And we look at the pre-image of this orbit in UK under this map P um, restricted to the orbit in UK plus one. So there's a pre-image of this orbit, uh, which I'm gonna denote like this. And it lives as a, as a subset of this orbit. Yeah, and this is just, I'm just taking a pre-image of a map. So there's nothing complicated happening yet. Um, and as Anton said, uh, this, this pre-image is gonna be non-empty if and only if these two sequences satisfy the interlacing inequalities. Something that's really important to notice here is that this map P is UK equivariant, where UK acts on the K plus one orbit via this inclusion. Uh, that's clear just given the description of this map. And then the other thing that's important to notice is that this orbit uh, through lambda k is just a homogeneous space, uk mod h, where h is some product of unitary groups, um, just uh, given as the stabilizer of this diagonal matrix with the entries being the lambda k, right? Because maybe some eigenvalues are repeated um, so you might have some stabilizer that's not just a product of U1s, but it's a product of some UKs that are having K possibly larger than one. Okay, so, so is, is everything in this slide clear? We're gonna write some of this out again on the next slide, but I really hope that uh, everything in this slide is, is okay. So the goal here is that this base space here is a homogeneous UK space. And this map P is a UK equivariant map. And now I want to show that this space up here is a UK uh, homogeneous space. So that this, this map P is now a bundle of uh, homogeneous spaces. That's the goal of what I'm about to show you. And it turns out that which homogeneous spaces you get as the fibers of this bundle is going to be determined by the interlacing inequalities. Okay. So, right. So instead of looking at the whole pre-image uh, uh, of, this, of this orbit through lambda k, I'm going to take a single point in this orbit lambda k, and I'm going to look at the pre-image of that. So let's take the, the diagonal matrix uh, whose entries are the lambda k's. And we just look at the pre-image of this diagonal matrix. And of course it's given like this. So it's a matrix with this form. So the k by k minor is diagonal with entries given by the lambda k's. And then uh, there's this column here of complex numbers and the other row across from it is of course conjugate. And then in the bottom right corner, there's some real number C. Now, 
we know that this A is in the orbit through lambda k plus one. So the eigenvalues of this matrix A have to be the numbers lambda k plus one, one through lambda k plus one, k plus one. So we have this condition that this matrix that we've written in this very explicit way has eigenvalues given by this sequence, right? And I'm counting the eigenvalues, of course, with multiplicity. And uh, yeah, so if you do some, some basic linear algebra, uh, you remember that um, the trace is equal to the sum of eigenvalues. And this tells you that C has to be expressed in the following way in terms of the, the lambda k plus ones and the lambda k's, because the trace of this has to be equal to the sum of the lambda k plus ones. And then the other thing you know, uh, because you have this equality uh, of the eigenvalues of A, is that the characteristic polynomial of this matrix has to be this expression on the left here, right? So it's just a product of all these linear terms uh, where the, the number is one of the lambda k plus ones. And then on the other side, uh, well, you know this is what the, the characteristic polynomial should be, uh, but then you have this explicit form for this matrix. So pick your favorite row or column and do your cofactor expansion along that row or column. And you'll see that you can write uh, an explicit formula for the determinant of the matrix A that looks like this. So this condition that these are the eigenvalues, it gives you this equality of two polynomials, which really is a system of equations uh, involving the variables Z1 through Zk. So this is really a system of equations, which defines like a subvariety uh, where uh, you have this fiber. Now in, the, in this uh, matrix A, most of this stuff doesn't matter, right? The lambdas are fixed and C because of the lambdas being fixed is also fixed. So what we can do is we can just identify this fiber with the subvariety of CK defined by this system of two equations um, by just sending A to the vector whose entries are given by the Zs, right? And um, here I want to, to break CK into a product of CKIs, where KI are the, the multiplicities of the eigenvalues lambda K. The reason that I do this um, is because you recall that uh, this orbit through the lambda K, this is a homogeneous space where the, the stabilizer of this point was this particular product of unitary groups. And the map P is equivariant. So that means that this stabilizer of this point should act on this fiber. And what we want to do is we under, understand how this product of unitary groups acts on this fiber. And then you note that this map here from the fiber into CK, if you consider this product as just a product of the standard representations of the unitary groups UK, uh, UK1 acting on CK1, UK2 acting on CK2 and so forth, this map is clearly uh, equivariant with respect to the, the action of H on this fiber and the standard representation that, uh, that's described here. And you can just see that from the, the form of the matrix. So now we have a subvariety of CK and it's acted upon by this group H um, by the sort of product of standard representations. And it's cut out by these two equations. And we want to say, what is this subvariety? Uh, and it turns out that we can give a very explicit answer to this, this question, and it's uh, quite simple. So at least at this point, is, is it clear? Yeah, so deriving you know, the, the, this uh, determinant, uh, this, this characteristic polynomial, it might be a nice exercise. Right, so we said that the lambda k plus one and lambda k satisfy interlacing inequalities. And so uh, together they define an interlacing pattern, which is just like two rows, two consecutive rows in the gelfand sutland pattern, really, but we're just focusing on these two rows. Um, and so if you fix two uh, particular values of, of lambda k plus one and lambda k, so say something like this, then you get an interlacing pattern, which looks maybe something like this, for example. And uh, something that's important to notice is that there's three categories of connected components in this graph 
um, that occur. So uh, one can call them like M trapezoid shapes, parallelogram shapes, and W trapezoid shapes. So uh, starting from the left, this is a W trapezoid. This is a parallelogram. Uh, this isolated vertex is like a degenerate M trapezoid shape. And then this is a parallelogram again. This is a W trapezoid shape, and this is an M trapezoid shape, and this is a W trapezoid shape. So you see there's like this classification into the, the three different shapes. In fact, for us, only the M trapezoid shapes will matter, but um, in some other projects, it turns out that the difference between the parallelogram shapes and the W trapezoid shapes actually matters, but this is not for this talk. Anyways, so we have this, uh, this nice uh, pattern and we've sort of classified the different shapes that occur in this pattern. And you see it's important because if you have an M trapezoid shape, then uh, the eigenvalue, whatever it is for this connected component occurs one less time in the top row than it does in the bottom row. And if you take this back and look at the characteristic polynomial from the previous page, you, it's not too hard to show with a, a little bit of thinking that the system of equations is equivalent to saying that each of these zi's in the CKI um, has norm equal to the following formula. So if the ith component, and here you're counting along the bottom row, so this is the first component, second comp component, third component, fourth component, and then the fifth component is this one, not this one, this is ignored. So if the ith connected component is, a, is an M trapezoid shape, then uh, zi in CKI is cut out by just having norm equal to some number ri, which is larger than zero. And in fact, you can give an explicit formula for this number, and it depends only on, on these eigenvalues, of course. Um, and otherwise, the norm is equal to zero. So, so what do we have? We have a product of, of uh, CKIs. And in each CKI, you have zi. And either the norm of zi is fixed, so in CKI, you have some sphere, or uh, the norm of zi is 0, so you just have the origin, right? And you take this product of these standard representations of the UKI, and then you see that if uh, it, it's the case where you have a sphere, well, then UKI acts in the stabilizer is going to be UKI minus 1. And if z is 0, then UKI just acts trivially. But in particular, what's important is that um, this group H is going to act transitively on this fiber. And this follows immediately from this, uh, this description of these equations. So because of what I just said, the action of H on this fiber is transitive. Um, and you can describe the stabilizer of a point in this fiber as a product of groups, which are subgroups of these uh, unitary groups UKI, where it's the entire group UKI unless you have an, an M trapezoid shape and then it's UKI minus one. And this tells us that this map P is really the bundle of homogeneous spaces, which looks like this, which is very nice. And um, of course the, the fibers H mod L are a product of odd dimensional spheres where when you have an M trapezoid shape, it contributes a, a sphere to Ki minus one. So Ki here, we'll call the width of the M trapezoid shape. So this is a, an M trapezoid shape of width one, and this is an M trapezoid shape of, of width two. So this will con contribute a circle, and this will contribute a three sphere. So in this case, uh, yeah, you have a, a bundle of homogeneous spaces whose fibers are products of a circle and a three sphere. So uh, how, how is this sounding? Yeah, I think it's like very, concrete and explicit, but then sometimes very concrete and explicit things are, are also confusing. So I don't know uh, if it's okay. Very good. Very good for me. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, so, so the point is if you look at one stage, uh, you look at some orbit and then you look at uh, the action of the one 
dimension smaller unitary group. Then over a orbit downstairs, you have a fiber, which is a certain bundle of spheres. But now we want to talk about the gelfand zetland system. So we need to fix a point in this polytope. And then we want to look at the fiber uh, over that point. And we should think about uh, what is the definition of um, the gelfand zetland functions. So we're looking at uh, this co-joint orbit, uh, which is determined by the top row of our gelfand zetland pattern, uh, which is the number lambda n. Uh, and then to describe the fiber, we need to describe a system of equations cut out by all of these uh, functions, these gelfand zetland functions being equal to these numbers, lambda 1, or these really sequences, lambda 1, lambda 2, all the way up to lambda n minus 1. So let's just talk about what's cut out by lambda n minus 1. Well, it's exactly what happens when you take the pre-image under that projection of the orbit lambda n minus 1. So when you just add to the system of equations lambda n minus 1, you get this, this, uh, this subspace here, which we just talked about. right? And this is a bundle uh, of, of spheres over this lambda n minus 1, and it lives inside the orbit. But then we should keep adding these equalities given by the gelfand zetland functions equaling these other numbers, lambda n minus 2, n minus 3, and so forth. And each time you do that, you can think of it as just going down one step and adding a new restriction. So here, there would be another uh, little diagram. So inside lambda n minus 1, you would have O lambda n minus 2 lambda n minus 1. And that is a bundle over lambda n minus 2. And then because we want to talk about a subvariety of lambda n, you should restrict again. So you should consider up here the space. And then to get the, the, the fiber, you just continue adding these extra conditions that each of the rows in the gelfand zetland pattern is, is fixed to be equal to the given sequence. And so you go down this diagram on the right side and you keep adding these restrictions. And then upstairs, what you have left over is exactly the pullback just by definition of, of these diagrams. And then finally, at the, the top left corner of this, this diagram, you get, you get the gelfand zetland fiber. So in each row, these spaces are getting smaller and smaller, right? Uh, but you're still pulling back. So this was some uh, bundle of UK homogeneous spaces whose fibers were given by this particular formula, whatever's in the gelfand zetland pattern in the top two rows. This tells you what the fibers are here. And this part of the tower is now a pullback of that bundle by some explicit embeddings. And uh, it's the same at every single level. So at each level, this stage in this tower is just a pullback by some sequence of embeddings of this, uh, this fiber bundle, which is a bundle of product of spheres that we described already. Yeah, and the other thing to notice is at the very bottom of this diagram is a, the orbit, which is a point, because U1 is having co-adjoint orbits being points. OK, so now we have this uh, description of this space as a tower. Um, yeah, still, it could be kind of like many different things, sort of, uh, you know, just because you know what the fibers in some stage of a tower are, I don't think this really tells you everything about uh, the total space of the tower. So there's some work to understand what these sequences of embeddings look like uh, in order to really understand this tower better. But at least uh, you can do the following things. So if you know that you're uh, space is the total space of a tower, and you know the dimensions of the fibers at each stage in the tower, then you know what the dimension of the total space of the tower is, right? And so you can count the dimension of your fiber just by adding up all the numbers uh, 2w minus 1, where uh, you sum over all the, the m trapezoid shapes in your gelfand zetland pattern, and w is the width of the m trapezoid shape. So I'll give an example in a second. And in particular, um, the dimension of this fiber given by this formula 
is going to be half the dimension of the orbit if and only if every connected component in the gelfand zetland pattern is part of a diamond. And I'll show you what that means in a second as well. Yeah, so here's an example. So we have uh, this particular pattern, which corresponds to a face of a cojoint orbit of U10. And um, just looking at the top row, this tells you what the dimension of the cojoint orbit is because it's going to be U10 mod U3 times U1 times U1 times U2 times U1 times U1 times U1, uh, which gives you a total dimension of 82. And then to describe the dimension of a fiber over this face, over a point in the relative interior of this face of this gelfand zetland polytope, you should just count all the M trapezoid shapes in the picture, um, being careful not to count shapes in the top row because those are fixed, so they don't matter. So first let's count all the shape, the M trapezoid shapes of width one. So this is one, this is one. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the, the, they contribute seven times one to the dimension of the fiber. Then you should look for all the M trapezoid shapes of width two. So there's one here, another one here, and another one here. So there's three times three is the contribution to the dimension of the, the fiber. Then there's two M trapezoids of width three. So this one here and this one here. So this gives you this contribution. And then there's one M trapezoid of width four, um, which is given by these two rows here. And so that gives you this contribution. So you have some crazy looking uh, face of, of some high dimensional gelfland zetland polytope. You can say exactly what the dimension of the fiber is. This is incredibly nice. So what, I'm, what do I mean when I talked about diamonds? So uh, when I said every uh, connected component is part of a diamond. So in the top row, if there's some equalities then you can kind of get like the bottom half of a diamond, but otherwise I mean like a full sort of diamond shape like this. And as long as you only have diamond shapes like this, then uh, the dimension that you add up will be exactly half the dimension of, of the cojoint orbit. So in this case, um, when we add everything up, we get 41, which is half of 82. Uh, and the way that you would prove that it's always going to be half the dimension of the orbit is just take a diamond, calculate the formula for the contribution to the dimension that you get from all the M trapezoid shapes in the top half of that diamond, and then compare that to just how many vertices are in the diamond. So if these were all not equalities, if they were all strict inequalities, what would you have? The reason for this is that if there's no additional equalities in this, uh, in this pattern, so these, these edges all disappear, these edges all disappear, these edges all disappear, then I get a bunch of isolated vertices. And this means that all of my gelfand zetland functions are um, independent from each other, which means that I'm looking at a point where the gelfand zetland system on that cojoint orbit is regular. And since it's regular, then we know by Leoville Arnold that we have the fiber is a Lagrangian torus. So it's of half the dimension. And then if you change some of these inequalities and add a diamond, you see that it stays to be half the dimension. So we have some fibers that are singular, which are half the dimension of, of, uh, of the, um, the cojoint orbit, but they're not tori. Um, they're not Lagrangian tori because uh, over the interior, you know, you have Lagrangian tori by Leovo Arnold, and on the on the boundary, you have no Leovo Arnold, so you you just don't know. So then the question is, uh, what about these other fibers that are half the dimension but they're singular? Uh, are they Lagrangian? And uh, the answer is actually yes. So this is very interesting. Um, so for any point in uh, the gelfand zetland polytope, in fact, uh, the fiber is isotropic, which means that if you restrict the symplectic form uh, to the fiber, it vanishes. And of course, you can have a dimension smaller than half uh, the dimension of the symplectic manifold if you're isotropic. Um, but if you have dimension equal to half that of the symplectic manifold, then you're Lagrangian. So in particular, by the previous result, you know that the fiber is Lagrangian if and only if every connected component in the gelfand zetland pattern is part of a diamond. So for example, I'm just going to go back here. 
all of these fibers, uh, except the one in the top right corner here, all these fibers are tori, it turns out, um, and they're isotropic tori. And the fibers corresponding to this pattern is a Lagrangian torus. But then for this pattern here, you see that uh, the contribution to the dimension is, um, is three, which is half the dimension of the orbit, which is six. So this is also Lagrangian, even though it corresponds to a vertex, right? So over this point in the boundary of the Gelfand-Sutland polytope, we have a fiber which is which is a Lagrangian submanifold. This is very much not like what we know from studying toric varieties and toric moment maps. Um, and moreover, in this case, it's actually quite easy to describe the tower because there's just two stages. And the top stage, you have uh, an M-trapezoid shape of width two. So you get that the fiber is U2 mod U1, which is SU2, or better to call it the three sphere. So in fact, the fiber over this vertex is a Lagrangian three sphere. Yeah, and this is very interesting. Of course, this argument is only going to work uh, to describe this tower in this particular case, um, because it's a tower with only two stages and the bottom stage is trivial. So to describe the towers uh, when there's more stages and some stages aren't trivial, then it's going to be a bit harder. Yeah, and to prove this, uh, what you need to show is that at each, at each stage in this, uh, in this uh, tower, well, really, you can look at the projection from this space down onto lambda k, O lambda k. And if you take two vectors which are tangent to this, um, then the, their pairing with respect to the kks form on omega lambda k is equal to the pairing with respect to the kks form of, of of uh, omega lambda k, sorry, k plus one here and k here, uh, when you take their images under the projection. Um, and this is actually a, a completely explicit, I'm sorry. Uh, let me go back to, yeah, this is something you can show sort of completely explicitly um, if you like. So this is a, a direct computation. The important thing to notice here is that if you have two vectors that are tangent to this submanifold of omega lambda k plus one, then you know that uk acts transitively on this space. So actually these two vectors have to be fundamental vector fields for the action of uk. And that, that's helpful when you do this exercise. Yeah, so I promised that we would say something explicit about what the fibers look like. And then, yeah, maybe this uh, theorem, it's kind of sounds a bit complicated, but, uh, but, it's, but it's quite nice, I think. So um, we're looking at this tower and it's in this big diagram of pullbacks. And on the right side, we had these very nice bundles of, of um, UK homogeneous spaces with fibers that are very explicit. And I said that the difficult part to describe the tower topologically is that you have these horizontal sequences of embeddings um, and it, you, know, you need to get a handle on those. And so uh, it, this is a recent paper with uh, Jeffrey Carlson um, where we sort of looked very carefully at those horizontal embeddings and you can kind of like untwist them uh, in a nice way. And when you do that, it turns out that you can describe uh, the tower in I think a much simpler form which is the following. So if you take a point in the gelfand sutland polytope um, and you're looking at the fiber over this, uh, over this point, then uh, in fact, it, it decomposes as a direct product of spaces that are indexed by the connected components of the gelfand sutland pattern. Yeah, this uh, decomposition actually was already known to uh, these authors down here, I should say. Um, but uh, in fact, uh, this theorem that we proved, actually, it's uh, more general. We also proved it for gelfand sutland systems on orthogonal uh, co-adjoint orbits as well, which maybe we're not talking about in this course as much. But um, you can kind of do a similar construction for orthogonal co-adjoint orbits. And uh, this theorem has sort of like a, a complete verbatim analog, except that the groups that will appear here are unitary and orthogonal. But it's very similar. So we also show this direct product decomposition in the orthogonal case, um, as well as the unitary case. And the, the showing that in the orthogonal case was new. 
but okay, so so uh, it it's a product of of spaces, and the spaces are indexed by connected components of the gelfand zetland pattern. So then, all we need to do to state the theorem is to just describe what the space is for each connected component of the gelfand zetland pattern. So now we focus on a particular connected component, and we let um, capital M be the sequence of local maximum widths of this component and lowercase m be the sequence of local minimum widths of the component. So I'm gonna show you an example because this doesn't make sense, I think. So like, let's look at this, uh, this big connected component in the middle here. So the, the minimum width at the bottom is zero is, is one, but we kind of don't care because the minimum width at the bottom is always one. So forget about that. The first maximum width is four and then the minimum width is two and then the next maximum width is three. And then you go to the top row. So actually uh, we treat the top row differently. So here the sequence is M1 equals four, M2 equals three. And then there's an M little M1, uh, which equals two. So this is how you define the, these sequences like this. And now there, there's two cases, whether your connected component touches the top row of the gelfand zetland pattern or not. So if it does not touch the top row, then you can describe it as a, a quotient, uh, which looks like this. So you take the product of the, the UMs for the maximum widths, and then you divide out by a free action of the, the U little Ms, uh, where they act diagonally. So the U little M uh, to the left is just included diagonally in a certain way, and then to the right, there's a, a particular embedding and the formula for it is kind of uh, complicated, but the point is that this is gonna be a free action. So you take the quotient, you get some nice smooth manifold. Um, so this is the, what happens when you have a component not connected to the top row, but if it is connected to the top row, then you need to additionally quotient out by whatever the corresponding subgroup uh, of or factor of, of that subgroup L was. So remember we had for each stage, we had uh, UK acting on UK plus one, and then downstairs there's a stabilizer subgroup H and upstairs there's the stabilizer subgroup L. And L was a product of certain unitary groups. So yeah, again, like, let me just try to make it clear from the picture. Um, so there's, there's six isolated vertices and these correspond um, to, uh, to circles. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, actually this is not an isolated vertex, but you see it has no maximum width. So it just, well, the maximum width, I guess you could say is one, right? So it corresponds to just a, a U1. And then uh, here you have the sequence two, one, two. So you get U2 times U2, and then you quotient by a diagonal U1. Um, and then here you have a, a, a sequence which just has maximum width two, and then it touches the top row. Um, and here you would have that your corresponding factor L is, is a U1. So you get, you get this. So the, the L is a U1 because this is a parallelogram shape. So you get U2 mod U1. So this contributes an S3 factor. And then finally, if you look at the big pattern here, we have four and then three. So you have U4 times U3. And then the intermediate uh, minimum width is two. So that you quotient diagonally by a U2. And then it touches the top row and it's a, um, it's a parallelogram shape. Uh, so then your L would be a, a U2. So you have to quotient by a U2 like this. Yeah, so uh, maybe the prescription is slightly complicated, but hopefully at least what I can convince you here is that uh, if you have a given galfon zetland pattern to read off what the fiber is diffeomorphically, uh, it's, very, it's very straightforward. There's nothing complicated about this whatsoever. Um, what is complicated is uh, how we sort of play with those sequences of horizontal embeddings to, to um, get control of this tower and prove that this is diffeomorphic to the to the total space of the tower. Um, but once you do that, this is this is um, this is easy to describe. Yeah. So to give you another example, 
So let's say we have some diamonds. Um, yeah, then uh, all the isolated vertices are sort of like a degenerate diamond. So they just correspond to some U1s. Um, so there's 17 of those. And then uh, there's two diamonds of, of width two. So those correspond to U2s and U square because there's two of them. And then there's a diamond here of width four and that's gonna correspond to a U4. So this is a Lagrangian fiber of a, of a gelfand zetlin system on a U10 coadjoint orbit, which is diffeomorphic to this space. And uh, yeah, I have to say, coming from understanding uh, the singularities of, of elliptic integrable systems and toric integrable systems, this looks uh, totally uh, kind of weird, but uh, that's what happens. Um, and yeah, maybe also to go back, and do this description for this very nice fiber in the case of three dimensions. So here you have, it's with two diamonds. So you have a U2, but then it touches the top row and it's an M-trap shape. So there's a U1 quotient here. So you get U2 mod U1. This is the same description that I said before. So this fiber is a three sphere. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess the kind of the question is, well, why am I telling you this? Um, I think maybe there's some people here who, who might care about uh, singularities of integrable systems, I don't know. Um, and I think that uh, maybe this deserves sort of like more attention to, to describe uh, how these integrable systems look. Okay, so another thing to just mention uh, in terms of uh, you know the topology of these spaces, uh, yeah, we can compute the integer cohomology of all these spaces. I mean, this is maybe not just so surprising given that I just described them diffeomorphically as these nice quotients, um, but actually this is what we were trying to do first. And then it turned out as we were proving this uh, that we discovered, well, you could just describe them diffeomorphically uh, as on the previous slides. So this, this result came before. And the way that you prove this is you look at the tower and it's, uh, it's a spectral sequences argument, which is why I was working with Jeffrey to begin with because he's a really kind of an expert on spectral sequences. I'm not. Um, and uh, for each stage in the spectral sequence, you see that the tower, the, 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 uh, for each stage in the tower, you see that the spectral sequence collapses on the second page. And this allows you to say that Basically, this cohomology is the cohomology of the product of the fibers at all the stages, which means that you can describe it as the exterior algebra, the exterior algebra generated by generators. They're indexed by all these shapes. Yeah, so it's kind of a very nice cohomology ring. It's very simple. So you have something like this. Yeah, and then. Um, I think Anton kind of said this in a special case, but in fact, now this is true for any cojoint orbit of the unitary group. So you fix your cojoint orbit and you look at a particular gelfand zetlin function. And then uh, to the left and to the right, you have two other gelfand zetlin functions, unless you're at the boundary of this tableau and then maybe you only have one. Or if you're down at the very bottom of the tableau, you would have none. Um, and uh, yeah, to generalize what Anton said in, in his talk, in fact, this gelfand zetlin function is smooth on the subset of the cojoint orbit where these two inequalities are strict. So there's no horizontal edges coming from that vertex to the right or to the left. Yeah, and actually it's, it's not so hard to convince yourself of this. Uh, um, I mean, because what happens is when the inequalities are strict, there's, there's no, uh, there's no um, min max things happening because of the ordering. And also when you're trying to write down eigenvalues as a function, it's only when they coincide that you have some, some problems. Uh, right, so, so in particular, now for a given point in your gelfand zetlin polytope and the corresponding gelfand zetlin pattern, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between gelfand zetlin functions that are not constant on the orbit and that are smooth on an open neighborhood of the fiber. And the top vertices of every connected component in the gelfand zetlin pattern. So what do I mean by this? Like if we go to this diagram here, 
then I would count one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and then seven top vertices of connected components. So um, this would correspond, if you think all the way back to the beginning, uh, the number of connected components that aren't connected to the top row is equal to the dimension of the face of the polytope. So here, the dimension of the face of the polytope is seven. And for each of these top, top vertices, because for instance, this top vertex is not having a horizontal, horizontal equality here or here, it's smooth on some neighborhood of this fiber. So you get seven gelfand zetland functions that are smooth on an open neighborhood of, of the fibers over this face. This is, I think, something that goes back to Gilman and Sternberg. So now what you get is for each face of dimension R, a torus of dimension R, which is a subtorus of the gelfand zetland torus. And that acts on all the fibers, uh, in fact, on a neighborhood of all the fibers over that face or over the relative interior of the face. Uh, yeah, then there's one fact I think is maybe uh, not so obvious uh, from the perspective that I've described here, but in fact, on one of those fibers, this little torus TR is acting freely. And then um, in fact, when you take the quotient of the fiber by that little torus, you get a space that's simply connected. Actually, uh, this isn't so hard to see because if you think about, uh, maybe if I can try to draw something here, if you think about a, a connected component, it looks like some product like this. And then you take a quotient by uh, some other subgroups like this. And now it's a, a, a connected component, which is not connected to the top row. So there's a circle that's acting on it. So one of the circles in this torus TR. So actually you also have a circle which is acting here and it acts freely. So really this is a quotient like this. And then uh, now just look at the long exact sequence on homotopy groups. And it's easy to see that this quotient space is simply connected. This just follows from uh, the fact that this, uh, well, you know some nice things about the, the homotopy groups of, of unitary groups. So this is automatic. So this is the space Y. Yeah, and it follows immediately from this description that it's simply connected. Yeah, in their paper, you need to sort of think more about the towers and stuff, and maybe it's a bit complicated, um, but from this perspective, it, it sort of uh, follows right away. Uh, hopefully you can see the, the board there. The screen is maybe like this. Uh, yeah, so, so it turns out that this uh, quotient being simply connected is useful, but we'll talk about this in, a, in one second. So maybe how am I doing on time? Probably I'm almost done. I think I have like five, five more minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. 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 Okay. So, so I'll be finished very soon. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, to to come back and relate this to geometric quantization. So now I'm going to say a story that's maybe like a little bit less detailed and and more breezy. So, uh, if you have an integral lambda n, then there's a pre-quantum line bundle on this cojoint orbit. This is kind of a very classical fact. Um, and uh, uh, this is uh, like Anton was saying the other day. And then the cojoint action of UN on this cojoint orbit with the moment map given by identity, this is prequantizable, um, which means that the action on the cojoint orbit lifts to an action on the line bundle and the induced infinitesimal action uh, of, of the Lie algebra on the sections of this line bundle uh, satisfies this nice formula. So there's an exercise sheet that I'll give you for this and it, it contains this formula again, so I won't talk too much about it. But then you wanna try to quantize the cojoint orbits of the unitary group. And there's sort of two ways to do it. The first is a holomorphic quantization. This is kind of like a very classical 
result, which is that uh, there's a standard complex structure on this co-adjoint orbit coming from identifying it with like G mod P, where those are, if you know what they mean, then you know what it means. Um, and uh, with respect to this complex structure, you can look at the holomorphic sections of this line bundle. And then you see that uh, it's roughly the finite dimensional irreducible representation whose highest weight is given by uh, lambda n. Now, uh, this irreducible representation has a very nice basis going back to Gelfand and Zetlin, and this was the inspiration for the Gelfand Zetlin systems, which is that, so if you include un minus one into un, then this irreducible representation decomposes as a direct sum of irreducible representations of un minus one. Okay, that's obvious. But in fact, uh, they occur with either multiplicity zero or one, which is less obvious. And that's uh, the main fact here. So this splits as a direct sum of these irreducible representations. And in fact, the irreducible representations of un minus one that appear here are exactly the integral vectors lambda n minus one that satisfy the interlacing inequalities with lambda n. And then you repeat this process and you keep going and you decompose into smaller and smaller uh, uh, irreducible representations of smaller and smaller unitary groups until finally you get to U1 and the irreducible representations of U1 are uh, just copies of C with different weights. So doing this iteratively, you get a decomposition of this irreducible representation into one dimensional subspaces, or you can think of this as up to scalars being a basis. And uh, at each level, because the decomposition corresponded to a certain row in the gelfand Zetland pattern, what you've done is you've indexed every subspace, one dimensional subspace in this decomposition by an integer lattice point in the gelfand Zetland polytope. So there's a, a canonical basis, so to say, of this representation whose elements are indexed by the integer lattice points of this polytope. And uh, this is what you get from uh, the holomorphic quantization side. Then there's this other type of quantization called Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization. So there you look at the fibers uh, of a map and uh, in particular isotropic submanifolds. In our case, all of the fibers are isotropic. And we say it's Bohr-Sommerfeld if when you restrict the line bundle and the pre-quantum uh, connection, um, there's a non-vanishing flat section on your isotropic submanifold. So then you can look at the gelfand zetlin system and what Anton said uh, uh, yesterday was for the, regular, um, for the regular fibers, which are the Lagrangian tori, they're gonna be Bohr-Sommerfeld if and only if they're integral. And this was the argument given by Gilliman Sternberg uh, to say that a regular fiber of the gelfand zetlin system is Bohr-Sommerfeld if and only if P is integral. And then this leaves the question because we know the dimension of the holomorphic quantization is equal to the sum of all the integer lattice points in the polytope, but we haven't counted the ones on the boundary of whether you should include the ones on the boundary. And Gilliman and Sternberg make some remark in their paper, like it's very tempting uh, to formally include the points on the boundary in this Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization, and then you get the right dimensions. So this is like an independence of polarization result. And it turns out that actually you can formally, uh, not formally, but you can do this from the definition. So uh, we extended recently with uh, two co-authors and myself, uh, this result of Gilman and Sternberg uh, to show that a fiber of the gelfand zetlin system on an integral co-adjoint orbit is Bohr-Sommerfeld if and only if the point uh, over which you're taking the fiber is integral. And this includes the singular fibers. Um, so of course uh, you have to prove this slightly differently um, because uh, you know it's not a regular fiber. So the argument that Anton gave is, is not is not going to work anymore. Um, but it's not so bad. Uh, and I, I kind of optimistically maybe I gave this as an exercise uh, for the mini course. So I don't know if this is reasonable, um, but uh, hopefully it's reasonable. So I can just try to share. Um, share the, the exercise with you. So there's some other general exercises here about geometric quantization. Um, but I think uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, uh, you, you, sh you should sort of be able to prove this yourself, this result here. This, this is part of some other project that we're 
working on. So obviously this isn't the main result, but the proof of this is, is really uh, not complicated. So I think it's, uh, it's nice that it's not complicated. Uh, yeah, sorry. So I, I went slightly over time, but um, I think it's nice at least to kind of like uh, uh, make this folklore theorem about independence of polarization uh, more precise in this case. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, Leonid, may, may I ask a short question? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Jeremy, how, how is it? You, you, you say that those sin, single integral fibers are for Sommerfeld, uh, but, but then the space of flat sections, is it still one dimensional? Uh, yeah, so uh, this is a good question. Um, this is part of our project, so I'm not sure if I know exactly the answer to this, right? Yeah, so there's like, a, this is only kind of like a zeroth order approximation of what is Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization, right? Because the one way to say Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization is that you just count the Bohr-Sommerfeld leaves in whatever your foliation is, right? Which is what we're doing here. But then the, the more, um, uh, there's more detailed ways to define the Bohr-Sommerfeld quantization, either using some sort of sheaf theory or using some sort of distributional sections. Um, and uh, the, the first co-author here that I'm working with, he really takes the perspective of working with distributional sections. And uh, yeah, so, so this is part of something that we're hoping to, to, to prove uh, in this work. Um, so there's this other result which is that actually, if you take the standard complex structure on the co-adjoint orbit and you do a deformation of the complex structure uh, with a parameter S, then as S goes to infinity, all of the holomorphic sections of that line bundle, uh, their support will converge uh, distributionally to uh, the bohr sommerfeld gelfand zetland fibers. Well, actually this theorem was only proved for the regular uh, fibers and for the interior lattice points of the polytope. So there's something left to show now. Well, we know that the integral fibers of the polytope are also Bohr-Sommerfeld. And then you also have those boundary integral points corresponding to certain holomorphic sections under the gelfand zetland basis. And under this deformation, it's an it's obvious question, like should the support of those sections also converge to those singular fibers as well? So this is what we're trying to, to show. So as a first step, of course, we had to show that those singular fibers are, are in fact Bohr-Sommerfeld, right? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and, and you know, just as, as a final remark, I think like I read a lot of papers where people call the integral fibers of, of the gelfand zetland system, the Bohr-Sommerfeld fibers. And I think uh, it's nice you can finally actually just say this without potentially lying because uh, before it used to annoy me. <laughs> It's not, it's not the same, of course, it's a definition, so you have to prove it. Is this also true for, for the orthogonal case or? Uh... Yeah, it's a good question. Um, uh, I think probably the answer is yes at the moment because uh, this project we're focused on trying to generalize this theorem for the unitary case. Uh, we didn't talk about the orthogonal case yet, but I think if you look at the outline of the proof in the exercises and maybe like there's not enough details, I hope to add, you know, if somebody has questions, I can add more details, but I think roughly the outline of the proof would work uh, almost the same way. The only question would be, uh, there's one step in that proof where you use the fact that this space Y is simply connected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then uh, there's a question uh, for the orthogonal gelfand zetland systems if the analogous space Y is also simply connected. And uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember. So, so yeah, one would need to know this. I think if, it, if it's not simply connected, then, then the question becomes harder because then you have to really do something. I see. And uh, the, the, this space, this Y space uh, has the same structure as, as in, in the unitary case, right? Uh, Sorry? I, 
does have, does have the same structure as in in the unitary case, like the, some pro, pro product of uh, orthogonal groups over. over yeah, some. yeah, yeah. So, so in for this uh, result here, in the orthogonal mm -hmm. case, what happens is that you get spaces that are quotients that look like this except some of these groups are orthogonal and some of them are unitary. So um, you get for some components uh, expressions that look exactly like this. So certain connected components that correspond to a unitary thing. And then you get other connected components that look the same, but all these groups are orthogonal instead of unitary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so it's just like that. Yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah, so this is just, in, it's in our paper. So if you, yeah, if you wanna take a look. Thanks. Other question? Uh, then it will maybe one technical remark. It might be nice uh, to have those exercises also posted on the school website. Yeah, so you can send them uh, just just to me, uh, so do you, do you have a uh, PDF file with the, with the exercises? Okay. Or? In fact, Jeremy pay, put it on the chart, so you, you can just... Ah. It. Ah, it, it, it. Oh yeah, so I should also say these are these are the references for the talk. So huh, some of the, the results I mentioned are, are in these papers here. Oh. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe. In fact, I, do, I don't see I don't see any file in the chat. I, I can send them to you by email. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Uh huh. Okay. So then, thank you very much. So we. Uh, uh, We'll resume tomorrow on 4 uh, 15 Moscow time, right? Okay. Uh, so, so, so